The day is young. Look at that. They missed us, man. Someone wake Hunley. Yeah, I was just trying to get him up. He was in the other room. I heard him snoring. I went over there. Knock, knock. Hunley. Telephone for Hunley. Good God. Hey, come on. I've been sitting here for two hours. I don't have anything to do. Hunley's busy. Yeah, what are you going to do? Interviews. He's talking to people. He's got 52 different shows. I got one thing. Yeah. This. this is all I do. Yep, yep, man. I'm in fights with a psycho who runs a internet company who's trying to... Oh. Hunley's got, other, <laughs> Hunley's got other issues. Hunley's got it. <laughs> battles to the death and internet fights. That's right. That's right. Oh my God. But wow, today. Okay, so we're taking a bit of a departure. What? We're going on, we're going on vacation, I guess. Woohoo! <laughs> Little uh, Caribbean um sunshine, <laughs> fun place. Well, Puerto Rico is interesting, like you said, because when we're if you're from the East Coast, you're not really. You live there now, but when you're from New York, that's where you go is to Puerto Rico. I go in L.A., you go to Mexico. But in New York, uh, for the most part, you go to Puerto Rico. So I've been to Puerto Rico a lot and um, I know it very well. But this is not about the travel part, but we will get into the cultural part in the beginning. All right. Well, perfect. You want to do your thing with the uh, VPN? Well, or what's the I, deal with that? I don't need to. There is. A, we don't have a sponsor read this week. Oh, I see. So. Oh, great. I see what you're saying. OK, so. Yeah, so we could just talk about Puerto Rico. God save them down there from the incredible, massive flooding that they have every single September and October uh, from hurricanes. But um, this is not the worst. When I was a kid, 1960, Hurricane Donner uh, came all the way up the coast. That was the worst hurricane until the one, I think, in the eight, late 80s in Florida. Um, Andrew. Andrew was pretty bad, yeah. Andrew was a... Um one of the worst in history I right think. right but Cat i think five. this is a category one to three to one, the one down there they just have an inordinate amount of flooding there's only uh two people who who passed away from this so uh, one of them from a generator which okay in fairness i live in a hurricane adjacent area like mm -hmm. we get them but nowhere near as often as like north carolina right and we're not trying to lessen people dying obviously it's always a tragedy but it does happen and it happens here as much that is not uncommon a generator death because right. people run their generator inside the house and then wind up dying from the fumes right i i it's hard to call that a hurricane death i know in a it, way it, it, they're stretching it i mean they've had times down there with 300 dead and there's a long history not just puerto rico the whole caribbean i mean i've i've lived in saint thomas i've been in puerto rico i've been in the dominican republic i mean it's a constant problem. It's the Caribbean, you know, that's, that's comes with the beauty. And, um, you know, it's, I'll tell you something about Puerto Rico. They have an incredible rainforest, El Yunque. Um, they have old San Juan and new San Juan. When we were kids, um, my father worked for the airlines and we would fly for free, uh, because of that. I think that's why my mother married the guy, to be honest with you, was the free airfare. But we would fly to Puerto Rico for the weekend and uh, we would stay at the Condado Beach Hotel. And as a kid, um, it was a great hotel. It was in San Juan. But I remember one thing in particular was going out into the park in front of the hotel Sunday morning and all the kids were in the park. And I said, mm -hmm. oh, what's with all the kids? They had, again, this is in the uh, early 60s. They had a giant TV screen that must have been 30 to 40 feet wide and all the kids were watching Sunday morning cartoons in the park. And I just oh, said, wow. I know, no, I, I, again, as a kid, this was amazing. And so all the children, it must have been a hundred children watching Sunday morning or Saturday morning cartoons on this jumbotron that didn't exist yet in our own culture. I hadn't seen one in the States. You know what I mean? It was huge, Eric. And later on, I think Maybe the first one I ever saw was at the Astrodome in Houston. Um, but even that, hmm. I don't recall compared to this thing um, that was, you know, perfectly clear cartoon pictures. I just, uh, and that was my memory of San Juan. I mean, I went back later. Did they watch like sports games on that too or no, something? No, I didn't. Else? It was taken away. It was only for the children on Saturday morning from what I recall. 
Again, I could be wrong, but uh, that's what when I saw it. Now, they, they have a lot of famous people that have come into our culture from Puerto Rico. And yep. uh, I was talking to Eric off camera about how many there are. And it's sports, it's the arts, it's music, it's dance. People like Ricky Martin, uh, uh, Jennifer Lopez, who's back in the news, remarrying somebody. This is Benicio Del Toro, one of my favorite actors of all time, uh, Puerto Rican. Uh, Carlos Beltran, right, the Met and Astro. Um, obviously suspended for cheating in the World Series. But <laughs> oh, one, of the, one of the great, great baseball players. It didn't need to cheat, Carlos, but the whole team was in on it. It was kind of like the Chicago Black Sox of 1919. It wasn't just Beltron doing it. But, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't play. This is uh, Rita Moreno? No, Cheeto Rivera. This is Cheeto Rivera. Okay, this is from, uh, I guess, from West Side Story. I think so, yeah. Which is a Broadway musical. That is Hector Macho Camacho, the MC I, I see on the loincloth. Yep. Uh, one of the great Puerto Rican prize fighters of all time. Um, he wow. died tragically young. I think he was like 50 or something. I don't think he's he dead. Hear. I don't I thought he had a drug problem. Is he dead? No, he's he's dead. Uh, oh, when I, I was know. looking for the picture, I was like, um, Hector Camacho died. I was like, oh, that's sad. Oh, what? what did he die of? Did it say? I or? didn't get that far. Okay. <laughs> I was right. just trying to get a picture. I was like, I didn't oh, know okay. that. I didn't know that. Um, um, oh, there's Ben Affleck with Jennifer Lopez. Look how beautiful she is. Yeah, I mean, and that's now, by the way, it's absolutely astounding. <laughs> there's some photos of her from back in the day. Um, Jenny on the block, she was, <laughs> yeah, even after that, she was in that movie with George Clooney, the Soderbergh picture, out of sight. I remember that was the first time I ever remember seeing Jennifer Lopez not following her music, was in that movie as an actress in mm -hmm. Out of Sight, the Soderbergh film, which she was wonderful. Louis Guzman, one of the great. I used to play basketball with Louis Guzman in New York, so he doesn't know how to play. But he uh, was a friend of Leguizamo's, and we all hung out. I was an honorary, ah, I, I was, was wondering about Leguizamo. Yeah, yeah, I was um, I was honorary at that point. So. Now was he Puerto Rican or like Dominican? No, no, he is, but John is, and John is a Colombian, and. Um, Colombian and something else. I forget what the okay. other half was, but no, but he is, but Louis Guzman is. Is that Ricky Martin or? It's Ricky Martin. Oh my God. Even he's got problems now, right? <laughs> yeah. He's got some oh very my. real problems. When oh, I understand. My. <laughs> oh my. Oh my. What happened to Jelly Bean Benitez? He was another one. He used to go out with Madonna. Uh, he played basketball with us too. I, again, I was the only honorary white guy, but um <laughs> uh, he had some problems also, Jelly Bean, I think, with Madonna. We, we've got to do an episode about your time with Legazamo. And right. It's an all did. it's an all Latino episode in New York. These are all New Yorkans, really. I mean, um, the, the Puerto Ricans in New York are called New Yorkans. There, there was a place we used to hang out on in the East Village called the New Yorkan Cafe where they put on plays and music. This is... Um, oh, oh, my. Oh, my. Yeah, she was... She Stunning. Was wow. Wow, I forgot. I completely forgot. Wow. And that that is, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Roberto Alomar? Alomar had a brother who played, too. He had some problems, too, um, Roberto Alomar. He spit in the face of an ump and called him a gay slur. And uh, he's kind of remembered for that, Roberto Alomar. Um, wow. His brother was a great catcher, Sandy Alomar. Um, but, and he was an incredible second baseman. They, he had like two or three brothers who played Major League Baseball. All right. Wait a second. This is the master, right? This is Roberto Clemente. Um, 3,000 hits. I, I mean, the pirate right fielder. Now there's a Roberto Clemente award. He's like the Jackie Robinson of Puerto Ricans. They have a day every day, which is his day, you know, like they do for Jackie Robinson. Clemente uh, spoke very little English and experienced a lot of racism when he was coming up in Major League Baseball taunted uh, by the Pittsburgh press for not learning English well enough for them to interview him. Um, hmm. One of the greatest ball players I ever saw. Uh, all I remember in the back of my mind is, first of all, he had the greatest arm in right field I've ever saw, except for Yasiel Puig. Um, but he would spin around after he caught a ball in right field and throw a guy out at third. That's in the back of my mind. But also remember the 3000 hit club, a member of the Hall of Fame, uh, tragically killed in an air crash Ooh. in the 80s, bringing aid 
uh, ironically, to uh, an earthquake stricken Nicaragua on his own. The airplane went down in a bad weather and he died in a plane crash. Wow. Really tragic. Wow, crazy. All right. Okay. Now we get into some culture here. <laughs> -na 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 -na. Um, okay, so these are the sharks, not to be confused with the jets. This is from West Side Story. This is the White Gang. This is the Upper West Side of Manhattan from the famous musical. This looks uh, like it could be Joey's father on the Joe. right. Joey from Friends. Oh, Matt possibly. Le yeah, yeah, Matt yeah. LeBlanc. Is yeah, there not any semblance there? Yeah, it could be. Could be. But I mean, <laughs> the test of a great musical is can straight people watch it and enjoy it? And this one and La La Land I, I, are the two my two favorite musicals of all time. And Thoroughly enjoyable, incredible stories in here. Here are the, the, the jets on the left. Obviously, the Sharks, a white supremacist group on the right, uh, not to be confused. Uh, there's some violence here, but the dancing, the music, I don't know what happened to the Spielberg remake, but this thing, uh, they, yeah, there's uh, um, a great photo of the Sharks right there. Uh, I mean, the Jets, rather. Um, shot on location on the Upper West Side. An amazing, ama it was a play, obviously, on Broadway, and um, just an amazing production. Look at that shot. This is one of the most mm. famous shots ever photographed in the film of them all up in the air simultaneously in a dance number, just to show you how crazy. The synchronization. Good. Yeah, absolutely amazing. That's why it's West Side Story. Um, it is a classic, and it involves immigration. It's a remake, by the way, of Romeo and Juliet. It's supposed to be the Montagues and the Capulets. Mm -hmm. Uh, sure. Natalie Wood playing the, the female lead and culturally assimilating the soul of a Puerto Rican woman. Uh, Natalie Wood, obviously not Puerto Rican, but um, a young beauty at the time who got the lead uh, in the uh, in the movie. They look like they could clear a car. I'm not kidding. Yeah, no, there's some p parts where they're doing that in the movie. I mean, and in not the play, obviously, but on Broadway. Uh, there was limited space, but on uh, the streets of New York, this was magnificent. Magnificent. Oh, here we go. Camacho shot in the face, died in 2012. Oh, I, oh, wow. So it's a violent death. Oh, my God. I know we had drug problems. I don't know what happened if that well, was. Well, that might be tied together. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> Sadly. But wow. Okay. Amazing. I, know my I don't mom know what happened to the Spielberg one. I didn't see it. I don't didn't know. go well from what I hear. I, I, right. It's hard to redo a classic like that and expect it to go well. But uh, West Side Story, I mean, I'm going to watch it again tonight. I haven't seen it in years. I see that it's on Amazon. So I'm going to take a look at it because everything's a uh, Sondheim, Jerome Robbins. Uh, every part of it is impeccable to people involved in uh, cinematography and everything else. So that being said, pretty good group of people, right? Sure. Nice island in the Caribbean. Immigration. Friendly. Comes Happy. to New York mostly. There's like a lot of Puerto Rican to uh, New York um, uh, traffic going on. But they're not happy down there, Eric. And we're going to get into why they're not happy in, in Puerto Rico. Okay. One of the reasons they're not happy, apparently some people, um, is the status of Puerto Rico, which is extremely confusing, which is why I wanted to do the episode. Uh, it is listed as an unincorporated territory. It's not a state. It's not a, co not a commonwealth, not a protectorate not a uh, anything other than an unincorporated territory with a mishmash of rights and rules and things they can do involving our governmental elections and representation and everything else. That's today. That's evolved over 50, 60, 75 years. But in the 1950s, in 1950, for instance, on October 30th of 1950, there was a nationalist party. And when I say nationalist, I mean, they wanted independence. There was also the uh, Popular Democratic Party that wanted to be a commonwealth. Um, but the Nationalist Party was an extreme nationalistic party that wanted independence from the United States of America to make its own country. No, we're and cool that, with that, right? What's that? We're cool with that, though, right? I'm cool with it. I Look, I would be very happy if they wanted independence. But apparently nobody would give it to them, and there was a certain segment of the population that was not happy with that. Now, oh. hold on for a second before we get to these unhappy people who are coming. The, um, in 19, October 30th, 1950, the Nationalist Party starts a mass 
uh, insurrection, insurrection across the island, taking over and having shootouts with police stations, post offices, uh, governor's mansions, everything, everything across the island. This guy, Campos, uh, was the head of the party, and there's some dispute as to whether he planned it or not. But the insurrection is massive. And we send down 5,000 National Guard, those P-47 uh, fighters that are obviously propellers with bombs, and we send them down. The Yeah, they did bombing runs and machine gun strafing of apartment buildings all through Puerto Rico uh, in every town, bombing them. I mean, crazy, really crazy stuff. And they... Um, also helped the people on the ground that were the um, National Guard for the United States. We sent down 5,000. Here, here's a, an American sergeant rounding up an entire Puerto Rican family in a village. I mean, this was some operation. And I, as I said to you, in 1950, Truman uh, later called this a squabble among Puerto Ricans. They did not want this to get out to the mainstream media. There was no coverage of this in 1950. They did not want this because this here, look at these guys. This is United States National Guard taking over every town in Puerto Rico. And nobody knows about this story, which is why I want to do it. It is an American untold story because even though it's not America, technically. Yeah, um, it is. <laughs> I know, I know. It's kind of a trick question on this one. It's kind of a, is it America or is it is it another country? This is the Puerto Rican National Guard rounding up their own citizens uh, in a village and and uh, taking them in as prisoners. Over 3,000 Puerto Ricans were taken in as prisoners uh, during the insurrection. So this particular insurrection will fail. But in New York are two guys in New York, who are not happy that this insurrection failed. Um, some of these people are in New York, obviously. So these two guys, Colazzo, which I showed you a picture of, and his wife, and a guy named Grazilio Torresola are friends, of course, on the Upper West Side. This is Colazzo and his wife. Um, she's a nice couple. Not his wife. This is, I'll take it back. He left his wife. And he's got a mistress, which is her, and she's pregnant with a child. Okay. He looked like a nice guy. He also though. quit his job, and he's getting American welfare in New York, because that's what, that's what we do here. So this Puerto Rican uh, nationalist is living in Manhattan with this woman, and he's not happy about the insurrection and says, we got to do something. That's, it. that's his partner. Um, that's Torresola. Torresola is 25 years old. And Oscar Colazzo is 36. They decide to get on a train in New York and the Grand Central Station and go to Washington, D.C. And they get to Washington, D.C. with a plan. And their plan is to assassinate the president of the United States of America, Harry Truman. And they, oh. as they said, they have no beef with Truman. But if you want to make a statement, you have to kill the man on top of the uh, country and and make that statement. And their whole plot to kill Truman is not that Truman did anything uh, personally to them. In fact, Truman uh, had allowed for the first time Puerto Rico to have its own governor, was pushing a constitution for Puerto Rico. He was mm -hmm. quite liberal in terms of Puerto Rico. And as was the Democratic Party in general, which we're going to get to because we're going to go across. <laughs> well, of course, that's how you go. I mean, talk about biting the hand that feeds you. <laughs> exactly. exactly. You're going to see that this hand gets bitten repeatedly uh, for reaching into the cage. So these two guys go to Blair House. Now, Blair House is across the street from the White House, which, which is getting renovated. And they show up. And they've got, I don't know how they got these guns, but they have two German Lugers. This is the most fam favorite gun of these Puerto Rican nationalists is German Luger. And it's a nine millimeter. And I guess it's because it, it you know, it's semi-automatic and they've got, um, they can reload it with putting uh, more cases into it. So they, they pull up on foot, one guy on either side of the block and Torres Solo um, opens fire on this guy whose name is uh, 
Leslie Kofelt, and he's in a police uniform because back then the White House police detail was under the control of the Secret Service, Eric. So technically he was a Secret Service agent, Leslie Kofelt. Kofelt gets shot four times from this guy, Torosolo. He gets shot four times. Colazzo starts shooting at the other Secret Service agents. There's Leslie Kofelt. Now, it's important to remember this because what happens is Kofelt is in is, is gut shot, chest shot. He's got four bullets in him, and he's done for. And in fact, he will die. He is not going to survive this insane day. A window is opened on the second floor by a Secret Service agent who pulls Truman away from the window, who has taken a nap in his underwear. The guy who will later uh, come back in the JFK case, that's Stuart Stout. Uh, Stuart Stout grabs a submachine gun out of the gun case and goes into the hallway. This is pretty smart. Uh, Stout takes a Thompson submachine gun out of the case, stands at the top of the stairs of Blair House on the second floor, and he says to himself, who's ever coming through that door is going to get this entire Thompson submachine gun. And they didn't make it through the front door. But but there was Stout, really smart. They were never going to get to Truman up the stairs. But Truman is looking out this second floor window, and it's there that another agent pulls him down and starts shooting out the window at Colazzo and his partner. And Colazzo gets hit numerous times. Here's a shot of Colazzo. Colazzo is hit by everybody. He gets four shots to the chest. He lives. He lives. This is not the end of Colazzo. Mir miraculously. <laughs> miraculously lives. I, I, again, I don't know how. And our guy, don't forget, we had our guy Floyd Boring there. Floyd Boring claims to have shot Colazzo through that hat, never hitting his head. Nobody can verify that. And that's just Floyd Bo Boring's story. There's over 30 shots fired by multiple Secret Service agents. And them, they're firing shots, these two guys. Now, here's the thing about uh, Torosolo. Torosolo is about to go. Yeah, there's the headlines. Yeah. Um, Torosolo is about to go up that staircase that you showed there in that shot. You see that staircase? Torosolo yeah. was going up that staircase. And here's the dramatic moment of this story. Because yeah. this, this, yeah, he was going up that staircase ahead of Colazzo. Torosolo goes up, tries to go up that staircase. But Leslie Kofeld, with four shots in him, props himself up in the guard booth, uh, on the ledge of the guard booth, takes aim and blows out Torricello's brains with one shot, killing him with one shot. And then he dies. And then he dies. Both of them die. Wow. I mean, just an amazing, amazing... Sounds like a movie. I, you couldn't script it in a movie. The, her, the heroism of Kofeld to, to take his time and aim with his gun, and he shot him in the ear, and it came out the other way, it blew his brains out, literally blew out Torricello's brains, you know, from his head. And and um, he's dead, but then they all riddle uh, Colazzo, and Colazzo is taken away uh, on a stretcher. Now, Colazzo and, uh, is sentenced to prison. He's sentenced to um, the electric chair, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. You just go, well, that's fair. You know, they try to kill the president. Well, well, that, they, that's typical of the time. Right. They kill <laughs> Kofeld. But guess guess who pardons him from the electric chair to life in prison? Harry Truman. What? He commutes his death sentence. I, I swear to God. Unbelievably, you know, out of, out of the uh, uh, kindness of his heart, Truman commutes the death sentence of Colazzo. Not that Colazzo ever renounces violence. Not that Colazzo ever apologizes. Not that Colazzo, uh, you know, never changes his point of view. Colazzo, we're going to find out later, is not done in this story. Colazzo is coming back in this story. So keep in mind, folks, we're now going to move on from this assassination to 1954, just four years later. They're not done, the Puerto Rican Nationalist Party. They're not done at all, my friends. They are on the move. They want nationalism for Puerto Rico. Not that anybody in Puerto Rico wants this, because plebiscites and votes that they've had have, have left them with one to two to three percent of the vote. 
So this is a radical fringe element in Puerto Rico that uh, is caught up in this nationalistic and communist fervor uh, that's spreading through South America, the Caribbean, the Cold War, and every place else. Okay. Not that they don't believe that their country should be independent. They do, and it's maybe deservedly so, as opposed to being a colony of the United States, which we inherit kind of from, we were talking about, the collapse of the Spanish Empire and the Spanish-American War. This is one of the chips that we get, not unlike the Philippines, not unlike Guam, not unlike everything else, but this one, it has some strategic importance because of the proximity to the United States. Cuba, I would think. Eventually Cuba, but right now it's 1954, so Batista's empowering sure. Cuba, but it will become important. You're absolutely correct. So in 1954, in the House of Representatives, uh, if we can if we can try to explain this story, there's, again, four people in Manhattan on the Upper West Side, Lolita LeBron, uh, the, the, these three others, uh, Rafael uh, Miranda, Andre Cordero, and uh, Irvin Rodriguez. The four of them are not happy with the results of the 1950 situation. They decide that they're going to get on a train. It's always the same train. And they go down to D no, no, they they go down to DC. The same again. train, no. <laughs> the same train with German Lugers with semi-automatic nine millimeter German Lugers. Again, you know, um, they you know have different uh, weapons, but nope, this is their favorite weapon, the uh, German Luger. Now, keep in mind, maybe they got them from ex. There was a sale, dude. Might have been a group sale or something. They bought them after the war, nineteen forty-five or something. Maybe Lugers were available on the open black market or something. I don't know. But they go down to the Congress of the United States. They walk in, they enter the visitor's gallery up above, and they begin to, um, well, I'll just put it this way. I'll just tell you what happened, and you can figure it out for the rest, uh, the rest of you people. They say the Lord's Prayer. I don't know why they said the Lord's Prayer, but they did say the Lord's Prayer. And then they unfurl the Puerto Rican uh, flag, uh, uh, Lolita Lebron. Uh, when they were walking over there, the men, the three men, uh, get scared. And they said, look, the weather's bad. It's late. We got here at six o'clock, five o'clock, whatever. Maybe we should call it off. And she starts walking by herself, uh, Lolita Lebron, saying, screw you. I'm going to do this myself. And they go, all right, OK, well, let's go with her. Come on. So the four of them go up in the gallery, the visitors gallery. And there's other people up there. There's other people up there. In fact, Ironically, the House was debating a bill about Mexican immigration in 1954 that has still not been resolved to this day, Eric. And that was what was on the floor of the House at that time. So she stands up and says, Viva, uh, liberate uh, uh, Puerto Rico, and unfurls the flag. And they begin shooting the congressman down below with the nine millimeter. This is an artist's conception of the event. Uh, they pull out their guns. Her gun has so much recoil, she ends up shooting into the ceiling after the first shot uh, downward. But they they wound five congressmen. Another guy has a heart attack. Uh, there's blood everywhere, bullets everywhere. People are scattering down below. Hundreds of congressmen are trying to hide underneath their desks. There's nowhere to hide. And because the gallery is right above the, the floor of the house. And they're just shooting nonstop. One guy empties his gun, gets jammed, he puts in another uh, cartridge. And yeah, this is now the, the pages. Uh, but just getting back to the shooting, how many bullets they un uh, unloaded, like 30, 30 rounds, Eric. 30 rounds were shot down into the gallery, wounding, I, I was even, not almost even split, but it was, I think it was three Republicans and two Democrats or three Democrats and two Republicans. It was a- it How was liberal a, of them. It was bipartisan. It was bipartisan. bipartisan. That's it. It was across <laughs> the aisles. They were shooting across the aisles. It didn't matter. They didn't know who they were hitting. But they, the pages, what you saw in that photo, these are the pages who, who had the presence of mind to start carrying out the bodies. But the assassins, the assassins, two of them run out the door and they are apprehended. One of them runs out the door, his gun jams, and he's knocked out cold by a, a house uh, a metropolitan policeman in uniform. He knocks him out cold, seeing him running. He's unconscious. Another one escapes, and the two of them, uh, Lolita 
LeBron, here she is, right? They make it back to the train station. They're apprehended uh, unbelievably at the train station, almost getting away with the crime uh, wow. because they're focusing on the, yeah, here she is. And that's, that's with uh, Miranda on his right, on her right. That's L uh, Lolita LeBron on the left, obviously uh, one of the masterminds. And uh, he was the second in command. He fired the most shots, uh, Miranda. Yeah. She looks in command. He seems to be deferring to her. Mm -hmm. There's the two of them right there being propped up. And they, they did a lot of interviews uh, but while apprehended. The, the press was able to have a press conference with them. Why did you do it? I did it for Puerto Rico. I didn't expect, I didn't, I expected to die so my country could live. She says he doesn't wow. speak as good of English as her, but there's a um, uh, uh, C-SPAN documentary from 2006, which I recommend because it has some of the pages in it. Uh, but there's the two of them. They uh, multiple rounds were, were fired by these two alone. She claims that she fired into the ceiling. That's a lie. She fired down and there was in, she wasn't used to the recoil of the Luger, which kicked her up into the ceiling where she continued to fire into the ceiling. Uh, but she was the leading spokesperson of the group. Um, so the three, the four of them are apprehended. And I don't know if you have any, maybe some video here. You might want to run a little video. Uh, I do have a little bit. Um, a little, now, maybe. just to let everybody know that it's not the best of quality. We do the best we can, but... Um, we get um, spanked down so frequently, it's difficult to find video to share and, and do all that. So if it's not here later, we tried. We tried, yeah. We have to excise it out, yeah. and we get burned again and again and again, just to let everybody know. This is the chamber of the House of Representatives within a few moments after it was emptied, still showing the aftermath of the wild hail of bullets by fanatic Puerto Rican nationalists. Outside the Capitol, hospital and emergency units quickly mobilized to care for the five wounded congressmen cut down in the fantastic sudden shooting. Very seriously hurt is Representative Alvin Bentley of Michigan. Also hit by the flying bullets are Congressman Ben Jensen of Iowa, Clifford Davis of Tennessee, Kenneth Roberts of Alabama, and George Fallon of Maryland. Even as the stricken five are rushed away to hospitals, observers regarded a miracle that more were not heard in the crowded chamber by maniacs firing at close range. Under heavy guard are the would-be assassins, Mrs. Lolita Lebrun, who boldly claims she's instigator of the murder plot. Seized yeah. with her in the visitor's gallery, Andrew Carderos. Another who brazenly sprayed bullets and unsuspecting congressman is Rafael Miranda. A fourth member of their group evaded capture in the House chamber. He's Irving Forays, arrested soon after the attack in a Washington bus terminal. Yeah, they got him. Yeah, wow. yeah that's, a, that's a great little piece of footage. We'll probably get away with that. That's pretty obscure. But you get to see that that this is an insurrection, people. This is an armed insurrection. They wanted to, uh, in fact, um, sedition charges and conspiracy charges. And um, they claiming they didn't want to overthrow the government of the United States. But when you've attacked the government of the United States with bullets, uh, they wanted to kill as many congressmen as they could. And they wanted the world to take notice to the plight of Puerto Rico. Um, you could say what you want. This is not Iran doing this to us or the Soviet Union or Cuba. This is Puerto Rico. And I don't think enough people understand the history of our relationship with this nation or state or, or territory. It is not as happy-go-lucky as West Side Story is the, is the whole point of this episode. I mean, I knew about this, but I don't know anybody else who knows about this. You know, the assassination of Truman, combined with the 1954 event here. Now, let's just go into what happens to these people now. These people stand trial, and they go before a judge, and the judge uh, in the trial, they find them guilty. They find them guilty of, 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 of conspiracy, of sedition, of, 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 of the shooting. Uh, and the judge in the case, oddly enough, sentences them to 85 years in jail. And hmm. his name was an obscure guy at the time, named Lawrence E. Walsh. Now, I don't know if you know who Lawrence E. Walsh is. Lawrence E. Walsh becomes the inspector of the, the, the special prosecutor in an event called Iran-Contra, Eric. <laughs> oh, God. 
That's right. And he finds Cap Weinberger to be a perjurer. He goes after the the uh, uh, Bush administration and becomes oh, a Democrat. Yes. He switches party. He's a deputy attorney general in the Eisenhower administration. He ends up going to the Southern District of New York. Hello, Barnes. And he is from New York, switches parties, becomes a Democrat, and now goes after as the uh, um, uh, special prosecutor these... And the reason this is important is they cite Weinberger, the Secretary of Defense, um, with perjury. And the I think the, the Supreme Court throws it out. In October, right before the election between Clinton and Bush, he goes back in and recharges Weinberger two weeks before the election with perjury. And it's it reeks of Mullerisms and it's got a lot of echoes. And this is a lot of deep state stuff. When you're put on trial in the United States for a high profile crime, like these four Puerto Ricans were, they brought in a guy that who was deep state Dave, you know, and that's 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 who this Lawrence Walsh was. Now, Lawrence Walsh is brought back later as a special prosecutor against the Bush uh, administration, and it allows Clinton to defeat George Bush because he was closing in on him in the polls, according to most uh, liberal publications uh, that even the Clinton people said this is bizarre that that Walsh was going after Weinberger two weeks before the election. Even the Clinton people thought this was unfair. So uh, obviously something was afoot in the deep state and they were taking out one of their own in George Herbert Walker Bush, former head of the CIA. So this is who is in charge of the trial in sentencing these Puerto Ricans to jail. I just oh. thought that was of, of interest to everybody. Uh, he's in the independent counsel, not special project. It was called the independent counsel of Lawrence Walsh, you know what I mean, uh, back then. And um, a couple of guys got got caught, a, a, a colonel, an obscure colonel named Oliver North. Yeah. That's who he went after. And he was- Which, by the way, a, a lieutenant colonel. Right. Keep this in mind. Right. I know you don't have a military background, but when you're talking about in D.C. and like uh, places of the higher command, mm -hmm. as my wife put it, because she's a librarian on military bases, she's like, oh, I had lieutenant colonels carrying boxes for me. So lieutenant saying, colonel is like was a private. He was a low-level operative. Compared to a general? Mm -hmm. Compared to, yeah. I mean, a lieutenant colonel, yeah, he's very powerful to me, who was just an enlisted guy, but in terms of the generals and the high ups, yeah, lieutenant colonel, not so much. Not so much. The um, anyway, so that's that's deep state. Lawrence Walsh died just a few years ago in his own bed, asleep, hundred and two years old. They live long too, don't they? Oh yes, my friend. They they take care of you. If you take care of them, these guys. I, I could only say two names: uh, Henry and Kissinger. Uh, he may be 212 years old, Kissinger, and yet he's able to live on. These guys never die, uh, we, as we saw with Ruth Payne and and many of these other deep state operatives. My favorite is Cheney, because supposedly Cheney, he was going to... No, they didn't think he was going to make it through the first term of W. That's right. Because his heart was supposedly so bad. It's like 20 years later. I mean, it's like, I guess he, he got a fix. He's probably going to outlive his daughter, <laughs> which should be quite a treat. That would be quite a treat. Speaking of which, didn't, weren't they uh, well-received? Yeah, this is, um, they're national heroes in Puerto Rico, and we're going to get into that in a second. Um, but they're perceived as being um, uh, national heroes, especially Lolita LeBron. There's a picture where she's going to get out of jail, and we're going to get into how they got into jail after we get rid of the next group. Uh, this is called the FALN. Now, the FALN is the armed Freedom National Army of the, uh, uh, again, the Nationalist Party in Puerto Rico. The FALN was the weather underground of Puerto Rico. They bombed over, they had over 130 bombings in New York and Chicago. And that's the flag of the party, the Nationalist Party in Puerto Rico, by the way. Um, but the FALN was run by a guy named Oscar Lopez Rivera. He was their mastermind. And he, of course, lived with a girl in Massachusetts, you know, so he could do his evil doing. And they would rob um, uh, armored trucks and things of like that. They were one of the, the second largest armored truck robbery in American history 
was for $7 million pulled off by the FALN in, I think, 1981. Uh, this gave them money to do their bombings. And they bombed, my friend. They bombed a lot of places. And they injured a lot of people. What is it about four-letter um, groups like that? Because as soon as you say that, FARC keeps coming in my mind out of Colombia. Yeah, I don't know. A lot of the Spanish ones have four names. Um, just and for F. Well, there's freedom mm. and there's fighting. Yeah, I guess. And yeah. You know, there's a bunch of different things. But the point of the matter is this group um, was so aggressive. And um, also, uh, this was a Marxist. At this point, this is a Marxist revolutionary group by their, by their own admission. They're leaving um, documents and communiques in, 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 in um uh, phone booths in New York that the radio and TV people are picking up and reading and their demands and denouncing they want freedom for Puerto Rico. The United Nations is now taking up this case. There's different groups that are now, this is in the 70s, Eric. We're now into the 70s with these bombings and Puerto Rican independence. So this does not go away. And that's why I wanted to show the 50, 1950 insurrection because these these guys never say uncle they continued to bomb things throughout manhattan and in 1974 they this is 1974 they call up on the phone and a cop picks up the phone and they they're he's sent to a a building in harlem where they say there's a dead body and he goes into the apartment building and there's a trip wire that blows his mm -hmm. eye. Yeah, yeah, blows his face and eye out of his head. And this guy, Pazzi, it's his, I, I'm just going to get choked up over this because Pazzi is such a great guy. It's his first day on the job as a New York City policeman. And he's Puerto Rican. Jesus. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he's remanded to desk duty because he can't navigate curbs and stuff like that. And his eye was blown out. And this is what they do. This is what they did to him. And this poor guy um, will come back into this story because these other guys who are his friends in the bomb squad get blown up. They, get, they lose their legs. They lose mm. their arms because of the FALN. And the left kept celebrating them like they celebrated the Weather Underground, Eric. They thought this was the cause celeb at the time. The New York Times would poo-poo this, saying the targets were just business targets, and they blow entire walls out of buildings, a city bank, until 1975. In 1975, they escalated to this bombing. And this is down on Pearl Street, uh, which is next to Wall Street in the financial district of Manhattan. And this bombing happened at lunchtime in one of the oldest buildings in the city of New York where in 1783, George Washington said goodbye to his troops in this building. It's Francis Tavern. It's one of the oldest buildings still standing in the, in the city of New York. And they planted bombs in the um, uh, entranceway in the umbrella case that blew the walls out of Francis Tavern at the height of lunch hour. This is not middle of the night. We're going to take out a city bank for symbolic purposes. This injured over 60 people, four were dead. The forks and knives on the table that the people were eating with went through their bodies, their own forks and knives that were the place settings on the table they were eating from the explosion. Their arms were blown off, their legs were blown off. Uh, they were completely blown out the window of, of Francis Tavern down on Pearl Street. And maybe you could show a few pictures of uh, what happened down there. This is the cover of the Daily News, I think. This this photo, yeah, this is uh, them t taking him out in stretchers down in um, the financial district there, the fire department. Uh, yeah, this is the cover, 443. It ends up being over 60 injured, uh, and I mean injured. I'm talking about their arms and legs blown off. So um, there's an overhead shot um, down below. Yeah, here you see some of the damage to the front entrance. A uh, two-story restaurant is up and down uh were blown to smithereens look at that look at that that's what the puerto ricans did and this that's is, we remember a chandelier to give an idea of what the hell you're looking at right. you we remember, chair. the police remember this the fire department remember this and blue collar <laughs> kids in new york remember this and we'll never forget this
as long as we live. You grew up in New York at this time. You will never forget this bombing in 1975. And there's the World Trade Center that obviously horrific, obviously insane. But this, at the time, in 1975, was the most horrific terrorism in the history of the United States. And that's their flag that you show before. These are some of the sketches, uh, the people they were looking for. But the yeah. ringleader, the mastermind, there, there, there's the front of the building now, uh, right before, when it happened there. They brought in some hook and ladders to try to get the bodies out of the second floor because the staircase was gone. Oh. There was no staircase anymore. Jesus. And the windows were blown out across the street. I mean, look at the There's downstairs. a staircase right there, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was no way to get up there. They had to bring the fire department and take the people out through the through the where the windows used to be uh, on the second floor is a two floor restaurant. Um, and then they, they issued a communique. They, 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 they put together a communique. The, um, let me see if I still have it. They, because they bragged about it. <laughs> and, and, and they said, um, there's a copy of it right here from the FALN. Uh, we, FALN, the armed forces of the Puerto Rican nation, take full responsibility for the especially detona de detonated bomb that exploded today at Francis Tavern with the reactionary corporate executives inside. We did this in retaliation for the CIA-ordered bomb that murdered Angel Luis Chavanier and Eddie Ramos, two innocent young workers who supported Puerto Rico. Uh, the bombs exploding in Puerto Rico and the United States in support of striking workers and demand of uh, the release of our political prisoners and our independence and to protest the Rockefeller Kissinger visits uh, have avoided any injury to innocent people. I, I mean, these are previous bombs, I guess. Um, in our communique number two, we warned the North American government that to terrorize and kill our people would mean retaliation by us. This was not an empty warning. Release Oscar Colazzo, Lolita Lebron, Rafael Cancel Miranda, Andre mm -hmm. Cordero, and Irving Flores. And that's how it ends. They want the release of these prisoners. And this guy goes on the run. They know who he is. And they, they pick him up by accident. Uh, six years later, um, this guy that I was telling you about, uh, Oscar Lopez Rivera. If you got a picture of him, you could show it. This is, yeah, that's the top and bottom shots of Lopez Rivera. He's the head of the FALN. And he's the mastermind. He is the bin Laden of the FALN. He's charged with sedition. He's sentenced to 50, uh, I think, 35 years, 25 years in jail. And he is sent to Leavenworth, uh, Kansas, where he is uh, a prisoner there. He never recants. He never gives up and never apologizes for violence and, and trying to take down the United States. However, in 1981, they add 15 years onto his sentence because he's part of a mastermind external and internal plan to land helicopters on the roof of Leavenworth with machine guns and take out the guards and escape uh, from Leavenworth uh, prison. And the plot almost goes to fruition. And he's caught and the plot is busted internally, uh, but they add 15 years onto the sentence of uh, uh, Rivera. And then he, he does not want his sentence uh, commuted. He doesn't even try for parole. In fact, I think at his trial, which he says was not a fair trial, he refused to have an attorney and refused to testify, refused to um, uh, have any uh, cooperation with the trial itself. I think that's why he got the, the sentence that he got. So uh, it's, it's very interesting what happens to Lopez because uh, he is the leader of this group. Now, you say, well, how, 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 how bad can this be, right? So Jimmy Carter, for reasons that, okay, are highly suspicious, commutes the sentences of the Puerto Rican nationalists, those four, those four that we saw, the original four, is commuted and also Colazzo. This is Jimmy Carter in 1978. Keep in mind, the FALN bombing happens in 1975. In 1978, Jimmy Carter, pardon, pardon, he commutes their sentence and they go home to Puerto Rico. But there's a photo of, of, of uh, uh, Lolita LeBron. She goes to see somebody else in another country. 
I don't know if you have that shot, but there's a shot of her uh, immediately going to visit someone else. No. And in that photo, thank you. In that <laughs> photo, she shows up. I'll just tell people what it looked like, and then Hunley can find it after the show. But she goes directly into the arms and the embrace of Fidel Castro. And that's where, that's right. there's a photo of her being embraced that I sent you. That she's embraced by Fidel Castro. And the rest of them land to a cheering crowd of Puerto Ricans, 5,000 strong, who knock down the fence and embrace them as national heroes. Uh, massive crowd in, in San Juan at the airport. And what, what the guy says, Miranda, uh, oh, excuse me, let me get to Colazzo, because Colazzo is with them. Colazzo says, it would quote, it would not be justice for Griselio if we merely remembered him for his ability with weapons. We must remember the brave and expert guerrilla of the mountains of Jaihuya as the patriot who never had doubts when his country called him to completion of his duty. So here he is issuing a communique about the marksmanship of his dead partner who killed who killed the guy from, from uh, guarding Harry Truman. Jesus. Right. That's what kind of scumbags these people are. Just so you know. I mean, and we never forgot this in New York. The people in New York know what I'm talking about, about these guys. Uh, it did, again, the New York Times played it down. The news media played it down. These were considered to be leftist revolutionaries, very romantic. The Che Guevara's of the 70s and 60s and into the 80s. And the left embraced them like they were their communist brothers. Hey, don't worry. Um, Oscar's doing well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He is. Uh, he's still fighting <laughs> the good fight. He's still fighting the good fight. Yeah, I mean, so he's saluting you, Mark. Wow. wow. <laughs> I thought I'd right. show that one. <laughs> yeah. How about trying to get your people to vote against having us? Uh, you know, they, they've had a number of elections where if they spent some time working their own countrymen into voting, uh, they might not have had to kill Americans uh, in New York to do this, but they chose another route. So they do not denounce the violence. They do not apologize for killing people. They do not do any of this stuff. And and Jimmy Carter pardons these people. And then Bill Clinton comes in and Bill Clinton gets involved with a pardon. And you say, like, well, who is Bill Clinton going to pardon? He's uh, the last night in office. I just want to take a look if I remember this correctly, because it's it's he starts pardoning uh, the last of them. He starts pardoning a couple of the other people involved in this situation. And even Hillary Clinton comes out and denounces her own husband for commuting the sentences of these people. Hmm. Oh, let me just see this here. The uh, yeah. So anyway, so Clinton uh, commutes the sentences and then you wonder what happens to Lopez. Well, in 2017, Lopez begins to make some noise because Bernie Sanders and de Blasio, the mayor of New York, want Lopez to get out of jail and they want Barack Obama to commute the sentence and and pardon Lopez. So Barack Obama now commutes the sentence of Lopez, and he gets out of jail. So Lopez gets out, and he goes, where does he go? He goes back to Puerto Rico, and Lopez is celebrated in the Puerto Rican Day Parade in New York. So the police, the New York Yankees, JetBlue, and every other corporate sponsor quits the Puerto Rican Day Parade in 2017 in protest, in protest of their honoring of Oscar Lopez, who is the Bin Laden, essentially the Puerto Rican Bin Laden of the Francis Tavern bombings and numerous other crimes of 130 different bombings around New York. So apparently people were not happy with him, but there were some people who were happy. I just want to find you um, Bill Clinton pardon controversy, if anybody wants to look that up. The um, interesting part of this thing was the response, I think, to a lot of these politicians about Lopez. And I, I was just shocking. I was reading this this morning. Um, Cornelius Rhodes, this Francis Tavern, 
Puerto Rico, assassination, Colazo. Anyway, there are some great statements um, by some. Oh, here it is. Louis Guzman. <laughs> um, okay, hold on. Just bear with me for one second. I'm sure it's our, our regular bunch. You can almost guess. What? Well, I mean, uh, was Pelosi involved? She was probably alive back oh, right. then. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Thing. Right. No, no, it wasn't Pelosi, but let me just, I just want to read this one. This is really good. Um, Obama's decision was greeted with elation. Spontaneous celebrations broke out in San Juan. Louis Gutierrez, uh, Gutierrez, a Democratic congressman from Illinois who represents the west side of Chicago, a uh, neighborhood in which Lopez grew up, said in a statement that he was overjoyed and overwhelmed by Lopez's release. Oscar is a friend, a mentor, and family to me, uh, wrote Gutierrez. According to the New York Daily News, uh, Vivitero Melissa, the Speaker of the New York City Council and a rising Democratic star, she heard the news. It was incredible, morale boost. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, who lobbied hard for Lopez's commutation, and New York Mayor Bill de Blasio both offered Obama their thanks. And Lynn Manuel Miranda, who has been a vocal proponent for Lopez, tweeted that he was, quote, sobbing with gratitude, unquote. He furthermore added that he would reprise his role in Hamilton for one night in Chicago, one night only, in Lopez's honor. Lopez's supporters refer to him as a political prisoner uh, or independence activist and characterize him as a man unfairly and harshly targeted by U.S. government for his beliefs, not to mention 130 bombings and armored car robberies for over $7 million. Uh, he has even been called Puerto Rico's Nelson Mandela. Um, absolutely astounding. Uh, wow. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I just wanted to read that because it brings it back to today. The, the Obama uh, uh, commutation brings it full circle. So what we've got is four Democratic presidents, Truman, Carter, Clinton, Obama, all pardoning in some ways, commuting death sentences, commuting life sentences, commutations to help the people involved in this and to keep the island of Puerto Rico, a democratic stronghold, which is why I wanted to do this episode to begin with. Now, you say to yourself, what, what got these people fired up? <laughs> what, what originally got these people fired up? Now, you showed this picture of a guy. and I, I, I remember Sorry, the, this is well done. What? More like Nelson Flandella. That's funny. That's, <laughs> that's pretty funny. That's well played, Slacker Dan. Okay, put up the picture of the guy in the army uniform because I'm going to explain who that is and how this thing happened to go so south so badly and so quickly. All right, let me get that. Adam up there at the beginning. I know you can do it. Uh, I eventually can do it. You can Somehow do it. Somehow I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. This Sunday. guy's name is Cornelius P. Rhodes. Now you say, who is Cornelius P. Rhodes? Oh, my God. I know who he is now. You, you now realize it, didn't you? He, he's a scholar. Okay. Or I do a scholar, I bet. Cornelius P. Rhodes is uh, not related to the Rhodes Scholarship. Oh, he's not. He not was a, in charge of working for the Rockefeller Foundation down in Puerto Rico, injecting them with live cancer cells and stuff in the 1940s after the war, experimenting on Puerto Ricans. Right? Oh, my God. So, okay. So that gets um, some people upset, but they don't know what to do about it. But what really gets them upset is the letter that got leaked that he wrote. And he wrote a letter that gets leaked out to the Puerto Rican people. And again, I talked to you about how the U.S. Navy was shelling the beach in Puerto Rico and uranium was getting into the milk and all this other stuff. Before any of that happens, this guy, Cornelius P. Rhodes, uh, who was in, in charge of this medical program down there, wrote to his friend. And I'm just going to read you the letter uh, of what pissed off and started this uprising, because it didn't just come out of nowhere. Dear Ferdy, the more I think about the Larry Smith appointment, the more disgusted I get. Have you heard any reason advance for it? It certainly is odd that a man out with the entire Boston group, fired by Wallach, and as far as I know, absolutely devoid of any scientific reputation, should be given the place. This is about hiring down there. There is something wrong somewhere with our point of view. The situation is settled in Boston. Parker and Nye are to run the laboratory together with either Kenneth or McMahon to be assistant, the chief to stay on. 
as far as I can see, the chances of my getting a job in the next 10 years are absolutely nil. One is certainly not encouraged to make scientific advances when it is a handicap rather than an aid to an advancement. I can get a damn fine job here and I'm tempted to take it. It would be ideal. He's trying to survive this, this scandal. It would be ideal except for the Puerto Ricans, Eric. They are beyond doubt the dirtiest, laziest, most degenerate and thievish race of men ever inhabiting this sphere. It makes you sick to inhabit the same island with them. They are even lower than the Italians. When the island needs is not public health uh, work, but a tidal wave or something to totally exterminate the population. It might e then be livable. I have done my best to further the process of extermination by killing off eight and transplanting cancer into several more. The latter has not resulted in any fatality so far. The matter of, uh, of consideration for the patient's welfare plays no role here. In fact, all physicians take delight in the abuse and torture of the unfortunate subjects. Do let me know if you hear any more news. Sincerely, Dusty Rhodes. This guy, uh, his nickname is Dusty. God. Right, okay. This letter gets leaked by the person he's writing it to. His career is over. But this gets leaked to the Puerto Rican people, and it becomes like their Tuskegee incident with the African-Americans with syphilis. This is what was going on with the Rockefeller Foundation down there in Puerto Rico in the 1940s and into the 50s. And that's why Cornelius P. Rhodes is of interest to this story, because that's what sparks all of their national crazy of, of ferment that they have to break free of this colonial situation. Uh, not unjustified once you read that letter. Yeah, that would that would piss off some people. And yeah, you were telling me about um, the bit with the uh, Navy. Oh yeah, this was the shelling of, of, uh, of the beaches uh, with uranium uh, type shells that got into the water supply, got into the grass, got into the milk because the cows ate it got strontium-90 into the milk, started causing birth defects. And uh, there's a whole long thing about that. It became one of those environmental sites, Eric. What's that called when there's a huge environmental cleanup site? I don't know the specific It was declared an environmental disaster, finally. And everybody went down there to protest the Navy shelling this beach repeatedly for, for artillery practice, right? And... Various people went down there, including a guy who was arrested down there at the time named Robert F. Kennedy Jr. He was put he, as part of the protest, um, you know, symbolic protest to stop the shelling and um, the the radiation getting into the Puerto Rican uh, 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 drinking water uh, of the islands around there. So eventually the Navy had to pull out of there. But what I'm trying to say is in the story. As, as crazy as their actions were, we have a part in what we did down there. And I still to this day, um, there's certain minerals that we extract from there. There's, you know, a reason, obviously, the proximity to Cuba, Eric, was a reason to have them in terms of geographical uh, locations when Cuba goes communist. So they've been a pawn in a lot of games in the Cold War from 19, you know, after World War II to, to the collapse of the Soviet Union. So, yeah, they might be a little pissed. <laughs> they might. That, that's why I mentioned that. But so it's a huge story. I don't know how you put it on a thumbnail other than to have fancy colors and Roberto Clemente. But of the course, story, the story itself is a fascinating story and it couldn't be told any other way. I'm sorry for all the distortion that comes with this story, but it is a legacy of Puerto Rico in relation to the deep state in the United States. And they seem to be intertwined, these assassination attempts of and, and machine gunning of congressmen. Um, all of this stuff is intertwined. And the media has covered all of this up because it's from the left that is supporting uh, Puerto Rico and doesn't want this story told. And they have been burying this story since 1950. Um, all, all of these three incidents, the FALN, the Capitol shooting, the assassination of Truman, they do not want this story to get any air. It's not taught in school. This is only found in certain places like America's Untold Stories. And that's why we're here. That's why we're here. All right.
if that helps anybody, if you have any questions about it, I mean, we're going to post <laughs> some stuff on locals. Some of yeah. these videos that we can't post here. There's some good newsreel footage uh, from Path Service, uh, British TV, and um, some of the other stuff that we didn't feel comfortable putting on YouTube. But we will put it on locals for members only. Um, so if you're a member on locals, look, you'll look forward to seeing this fascinating footage of the um, both the Truman assassination and the Capitol um, uh, shooting and also the FALN bombings, which got very little coverage. Uh, but uh, Blue Collar New York was 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 co covering it back in the as was the New York Post and the Daily News. The, the, the New York Times, not so much. The New York <laughs> Times, you know, they it's kind of like their style. There was a headline. I, I just wanted to read this headline from the New York Times that I thought was interesting. Um, OK, yeah. <laughs> they had five massive bombs in one night in Manhattan. And it says, headline of the New York Times is, terrorists here set off five bombs at business sites. <laughs> That's the headline of the New York Times, just to get an idea of how unimportant this was to the New York Times. Five massive bombs blowing up. You know, up. it's just uh, five, you know, it's five today. Right. Yeah. It was five. I mean, they had... I don't know if they beat the weather underground in terms of total bombings, but they they're credited by communiques. There's a list I have, which I'll put on locals of every single bombing done by their own admission. This is them taking credit for it. How many were injured? How much financial damage was done? Uh, a quarter of a million, eight, you know, 1.3 million uh, just in 1975 money to 1983 by the FALN of blowing up Citibank, Chase Manhattan. I mean, people were killed in these bombings, too. You know, I'm just we were just focusing on the Francis Tavern bombing, you know, which was brutal enough. But there are other deaths from the FALN. And that was covered up because it was, they were supported by people like Bernie Sanders and people on the left who wanted to have Puerto Rico become another Cuba. That was their goal. They wanted them to be, and so did Fidel. I mean, Fidel was backing a lot of this stuff, you know, uh, because of his, you know, uh, uh, idea to spread communism in the Caribbean. So uh, the, the Bernie Sanders was not alone. Oh, sure. <laughs> Obviously, he had support. He had a lot of support. It's a fun, fun, dark story. <laughs> it's a dark story, but it's got nice thumbnail colors with Roberto Clemente. Of course. I, see, I did my part. You did your I, I part. I started and, out and sunny. It starts out with West Side Story and then goes downhill from there. But, I mean, you know, how <laughs> else can you tell the story? You know, because Puerto Rico has a lot of cultural influence in the United States. Um, oh, yeah. So it's not all bad, obviously. And it's a Oh, no. I mean, in the Army, too. I mean, there's a huge yeah, yeah. Um, Puerto Rican contingent in the Army um, right. all over. and. No, they're completely assimilated. So right. it's, no, 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 absolutely, absolutely, and and but this is the story that nobody wants you to hear, and that's why we do these stories, Eric and I, so you can learn America's untold stories. And um, you know, if you want to join us on locals, that would be really helpful. I think it's what is it, five dollars a month or something, Eric? Or five bucks a month or fifty dollars a year? Yeah, I try to put things there. I do a a show on there every Saturday. I'm pretty consistent. Just a kind of a hangout. To do something extra, um, Mark's always putting up different things, like some of the scripts he's written. His book is up there. Um, he'll find stuff like love letters from Ruth Payne. <laughs> um, There's a lot of rare documents up there. You know, one guy wanted to join, and he said, "How do I know these are going to be of interest to me?" I said, "Well, you could join." He goes, "Can I see them before I join?" And I said, "No, nah, I don't think that's how it works." But I think yeah. he joined. I think he joined anyway. <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of good stuff up there, and Locals is really a great community. I mean, everybody's got their own Locals. Barnes and Viva have theirs. There's a lot of overlap. Sometimes I'll go over to theirs, see what's going on, and they come over sure. to ours. So we do have overlap between Barnes's hush-hush uh, stories and our stories, um, the untold stories of American history. But um, uh, if you like this kind of stuff, consider joining. Or, as Eric says, with that red button that he puts up, that red thing about subscribing, because somehow... We hit 30,000 subscribers this we week, did. and our long, dark national nightmare is over. Uh, boom, there it is. There's, there's remember to subscribe. I don't think it costs anything, Eric, to subscribe. No, completely free. You can also tell your friend for free. You can hit the like button for free. There's a lot but of free. 
but there's people here who are pay, paying money right now, Mark. I mean, um, right. Texas Business Podcast gave us ten dollars, and oh, that he made you I, the second most interesting man on on the internet. <laughs> this, this is Mark's humility here. You see, Mark, Mark is his number one episode, and the episode was titled "The Most Interesting Man on the Internet." So, right, which is highly <laughs> doubtful. Believe me, I'm far from the most interesting man anywhere. But that's what the guy was pitching it at. So then Hunley did one. So he's second now, Hunley. Yeah, uh, today, the voice over guy in the news story about the congressional attack would yeah. have been sure to mention the victim's political affiliation. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. That's true. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, Tony oh. went deep dive into um Well, you have to wait. She's way down on the list, but she's on the list. There's, okay. some, there's some people. I said to this guy, there's some people in front of her. Um, okay. And thank you, Mary Williamson. Mary Williamson. Um, we love you too. Yeah, that was nice. The uh, people like the channel, Eric. I don't know. There's something to it that they seem to like. Yep. And we, by the way, we have a rumble rant from Rolf. What? So Rolf is in two places. I've seen Rolf him in the lives chair. over on. He, he moved over to Rumble. He's lived. He bought a house on Rumble Street. Yeah, uh, but he's here too. He's here too. Oh, he's back. Okay. And, and he's a show. Um, he's, he lives. He's, he's, he's got an apartment on YouTube. He's got an apartment on YouTube and a house on Rumble Street. He's living in two locations. I mean, yeah, yeah. So I mean, he. I mean, thank you for the rant. Thanks for being here. Awesome. Oh, I, I, thanks I'll for the book you. people too, because I got a great book called um, uh, about rockets about Jack Parsons from the uh, PayPal book fund. Oh. So we're going to do a Jack Parsons episode just on Jack Parsons. And I got some books with the PayPal book fence. So it's really appreciated that you're doing that out there. Um, yeah, Jack Parsons is on the list. It's going to be about rocket technology and, and Alistair Crowley and Satan and drugs and some sort of sex and some other crap. But uh, yeah, the, I just got the Parsons book in the mail. So thank you for the uh, PayPal. Speaking of which, we're coming into Halloween. Don't you have... Um... Oh, oh, we are coming near Halloween, right? We're, oh, we're going to do the Amityville Horror mm -hmm. uh, with this guy. Where do you hear this story? This is going to be a great one. The Amityville Horror about the guy who killed his whole family. I don't want to give it away, but uh, I was there, of course, at the time. That this, <laughs> this well, as he is whenever, um, you know, families I are killed, Mark is there. Fake news people you two made to do the Super Chat in order to subscribe. I don't know what that means, but fake yeah. news people you two made. Um, so I get that these guys hated the Puerto Ricans. Which guys? Oh, uh, um, uh, the Colonel. I don't. I don't know. Oh yeah, no, it was just oh, racism. Oh, racism. It was. It was just some pure racism stuff. I mean, I don't think um, it was just racist. You know, pure, straight up. I mean, they were like. It, it just seemed like Nazi doctors that came over here in Operation Paperclip and just expanded their medical. There's other examples of this that we'll get into some when we do Operation Paperclip, but bringing in those Nazi doctors influenced our doctors, just like the taking in of Werner von Braun influenced NASA and rocket technology. And Jack Parsons was on the phone day and night with Werner von Braun, JPL. Right. No, no, absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to get into that with Jack Parsons. But I think about uh, Cornelius Rhodes, I believe that he was influenced by, and I'd have to do a deep dive on Cornelius Rhodes, which I haven't. I just stumbled upon this letter by accident. And I think Cornelius Rhodes was influenced by, um, obviously, Nazi doctors who did experiments like this in, in, in the concentration camps. And we didn't just wake up one day. We weren't doing this. You know, now, we, had, we had these people here, too. We had eugenics before the Nazis even came about. So right. We, and we've we, got some dark stuff. I mean, let's be honest. No, 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 no. I mean, eugenics is theoretical and it's, it's a race theory. But I'm talking about absolutely experimenting on different racial groups. I don't think the United States was doing that in the, other than doing it to the Tuskegee, Tuskegee people here in, in the United States. But this is an outside. Why Puerto Ricans? They, they, were, they there. were easy targets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. You had control of the island. You know, you were able to uh, uh, do what you want. Now, keep in mind, there was a uh, a, a captain, an army captain, who went to um, the jungle of Cambodia in the 90s and into the early 2000s, experimenting with an AIDS vaccine on Cambodian teenagers. Uh, and her name was Captain Burks, and she worked for Donald Trump. Jesus. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. She uh, had hundreds of Cambodian teenagers try out this AIDS vaccine that did not work. 
So wow. it doesn't I mean, change, my friends. It and does she didn't kind of, work for Donald Trump until later. She might have worked for Fauci at that time. Right, right, right. But she, she, she was the one who, who, who claimed to uh, have changed his mind about uh, putting in the lockdowns. because, And she said this, that Trump was for herd immunity and she convinced him to do the lockdowns. And she crowed about that. And then she retired. Oh, yeah. somebody else is retiring soon. Who? Oh, yeah, the guy himself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like well, how times. long can you go on? I mean, you know, he'll, he's one of these guys. He'll live to, to 100, 105. Absolutely. Absolutely protected species. Crazy. Crazy. Well, a fantastic day. Don't know what we have going to Friday. Probably something something chill, something laid back. Something that we'll need merch for? or Well, um, people can get merch anytime. Has Oswald, that, has, has that dog been inoculated with any kind of vaccine or anything? Or no, he's 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 going to live forever. He's going to live forever, just like fame. No, yeah, he's yeah. he's like Bat Boy. He shows up. He shows up. If you up. look, look on the internet and on Twitter, occasionally you'll see that he's showing up in different places. He's a hero. Right. He's a hero we all need. I and sent then, I sent some swag to Frog in Long Island. If you're watching Frog, I hope you got the swag I mailed you uh, for America's Untold Stories because Frog. Apparently set the record straight about Sonora House. He told me that I invented egg in the hole because we didn't have a toaster. <laughs> so I got some credit for that. But go on. Right. Oh, this is the grow bear. This is the grow bear. You yep. could see the resemblance. I mean, look at the brown and and him. I mean, there's there's a <laughs> the, the goat. I mean, there's a lot. Of, he looks like me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, folks. Um, PayPal, um, you can always follow for free. Um, well, you can follow Mark, just be quiet or he might block you. You can okay, follow me on Twitter. You something. They, <laughs> I, I do go back and look at your, I don't just block you because something you said. I look I look back at what you retweeted and if there's some shit I don't like, I just block you. That's all. I just don't <laughs> want to hear about it. I'm having fun on Twitter. I'm not there to argue. I'm there to just put out information. And there's a lot of trolls I found out, Eric. There's a lot Imagine of trolls. That. No, no, I don't know anything about this. These people trolling me now, trying to, you know, suck me into some bizarre arguments. But if you want to comment on the episode, Eric and I do respond to comments down below in the comment section. And I saw that people were donating money through the thanks thing yesterday. Yeah, Eric. super thanks. And we $2, do dollars, appreciate that. Right. Oh, no, it's awesome. Thank super you. Super thanks? Yeah. And thank you for the super thanks. For wow. Sure. Wow. I didn't know that was a thing. But yeah, if you want to get in the comment section, if you're not in the live chat, we do try to respond, although it's getting crazy because we've got over like how many 80 episodes now or over 100. Oh, really? Oh, that's why it's getting crazy. I mean, people are asking questions about episodes from a year ago. So it's, you know, I don't know what they're talking about. I have trouble. Point. I'll have trouble today. Right. Yeah, I don't. I, yeah, I don't <laughs> well, remember. It's already leaving. It's yeah, leaving yeah, yeah. now. I kind of disconnect after the episode and just get into research for the new one. So I, after I do this, mm -hmm. I'm just going to move on. I don't there's no time. I just got to get into these books and research with the PayPal books that people are sending me, um, uh, you know, the next episode, whatever the hell that is, which we'll find out tomorrow. Probably Eric and I will figure it out. Yeah. And if you want to send PayPal my way, I'm I'm saving up. I may be going to the um, very important concert, I guess, in Williamsburg. Coming oh, up. That, oh, no, that's incredible. The Hankley show. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, Dude, folks, what if an alternative Hinckley shows up like another anti Hinckley shows up a guy who's been battling with Hinckley, you know, cause I tweeted to Hinckley on the Twitter. I said, are you going to perform? Uh, he's not responded yet because he's bringing his guitar to this thing. This is a meet and greet with John Hinckley and, and somewhere in Virginia, right, Eric, or. I forgot. Yeah. It's a, uh, you, you sent it to me. I'm like, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Coming well, to a copy house near me. Only in, Amer <laughs> only in America can a presidential assassin come out and put out on Twitter, have a meet and greet. I, I, I'm sorry. I just. I'm waiting this. for him to get his blue check, by the way. And folks, his channel is still larger than ours. Right, right. Hinkley's channel and this guy. Frito. Frito, this Cuomo, has more subscribers than we do, which is a personal embarrassment. But It uh, is. It is. If you could, you know, subscribe to the channel, we'd like to get to 50 at least before the uh, the world comes to an end. So if we can get to 50 and 100. I think that would be a good goal, Eric. Yeah, 100 is good. 100 manly. I think 100. <laughs> I think 100, 100, 100, I can... we, we have a cute little button. But, folks, 
thank you thank you so much thank you i hope you enjoyed the uh, episode it's a little little different and we'll see you friday friday yeah.